Christmas and to see them, to see their eyes light up when they saw a character going from the portal and transported from our world into Skylands. Uh, and then the other thing that I always think about is the fact that working at the studio, we got a copy of each toy and each one of the games, obviously. And I didn't have kids at the time. And so I patiently collected these over the years for, for my own benefit. But then in 2016, I uh, had a son, and now he's five and a half years old. Getting to see him enjoy the magic of Skylands at, uh, at, at our house now is um, really special. So thank you guys for supporting the franchise over the years. And we've got some exciting stuff to look at today. So now I'll pass back to Luke. Yeah, so I think what we're going to do, that's a great segue there, Toby, is actually introduce our friends who have joined us on the stream here. Um, I think we'll probably get them in. So first up, we've got Paul Yan. Paul, tell us what you did on Skylanders and what your favorite memory is. Hi guys, uh, my name is Paul. And when uh, we were making Spire's Adventure, I was lead animator. So I brought my custom t-shirt to represent in animation. <laughs> and I just gotta say, I think, uh, one of my favorite memories about developing a game was just that as an animator, this whole project was such a dream because to breathe life and invent personalities into such a wide cast of characters, we're coming up with new worlds and new stories, new characters, new technology, new genre of gaming. Like this, there was just so much trailblazing that was going on and creatively, it was uh, very inspiring to take on that challenge. Very cool. All right, who do we have next? It is Daniel Akeda. Same question to you, Daniel. What did you Hi. do? What's your favorite? Oh, uh, my name is Daniel Akeda. I'm a senior artist, and at the time I did level art, and I also worked on optimization and uh, working on the ports of the Skylanders. But, yeah, I just hope people appreciate all the love and craftsmanship that everyone involved in the Skylanders franchise uh, put into. Cool. All right. Let's see who's next. Mike Stout. Hello. Tell us, what did you do? What were your favorite memories? So on um, for Skylanders, I was working uh, on the Activision publishing side uh, in Central Design, and uh, I came up and was at Toys for Bob a lot. Uh, pretty much every week, two or three days, uh, just helping out with lots of different things. And hopefully, I'll get to talk about some of that later on. Uh, I think my favorite uh, thing with the first game was when uh, the game came out and we we thought it was going to be huge, but nobody knew, right? It was still a little uh, uh, like, okay, let's see what everybody thinks. But it came out the same week as uh, Battlefield 3, so the reviews were all delayed a little bit. But that meant we got to see a lot of people in the community putting things up on YouTube before any of the actual reviews came out. Uh, like Teal Game Master, he did a whole playthrough series that we were all watching. Uh, and there were a bunch of other people, you know, making up songs, just that like, it was really cool to see people engaging with it. And then all the reviews came in a week later. Uh, so that was, that was just one of my favorite things. Yeah, awesome. All right. Who do we got next? Chris Nelson. Introduce yourself, tell us what you did. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris Nelson and I was an engineer on Skylanders doing tool programming, but then I switched over to making boss battles in the middle of the game. Um, and it is really cool to be able to talk to everyone who played our game, it's so cool you're all here. And um, one of my favorite memories, I suppose, I have too many, but I think just like seeing everyone being excited about the game, um, enjoying the game, like we got so many nice fan letters and fan um, art and um, just the, the joy, seeing your joy at what we created was just magical for us. So thank you so much for, for, for all of that. Very nice. And last, but certainly not least, Andy Salvo. Introduce yourself, sir. What did you do? What was your favorite memory? Uh, my name's Andy Salvo. I am currently the lead animator uh, at Toys for Bob. When I got started uh, on Skylanders, I was a gameplay animator, and primarily I animated a ton of Skylanders. Um, I've never worked on a game where there have been this many playable characters. 
uh, up until that point or since. Um, None of us have. <laughs> yeah, and it was really amazing because generally, you know, you, you spend, when you have a playable character, that's primarily what you do over the course of the game. Uh, and you focus down on that one single person or that one single character to make sure they're perfect. With Skylanders, it was like, okay, uh, you've got another one in two weeks, so let's <laughs> get going. <laughs> So you'd just be burning through characters and coming up with ideas. And I think that kind of dovetails into my favorite memory of working on the original Skylanders. It was really that uh, there were so many things happening, so many characters and so many even enemies and things to get done uh, that uh, we, we generally get to a point where the animators and the designers and everybody were so swamped that every idea would get considered. Uh, so an animator could come up with an idea for a Skylander's motion or move set or tack, and the designer would be like, sure, let's try it. And we ended up in this place where it felt like such a wonderful collaboration between the different teams and creating each one of those characters. I do think that's kind of what made them feel so good in the end. Um, and then, yeah, I forgot to tell you, but, uh, after the original Skylanders, I became the cinematic lead and I focused more on story and taking some of those wonderful cutscenes off Ray's plate. So you have to script everything along the way. Um, but yeah, it was an amazing experience and um, yeah, I've never worked on a game quite like it. Well, thank you everyone for uh, joining us and thank you to our fellow developers. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lou Stuttert uh, and 10 years ago, uh, I had made my way out of QA and became production coordinator at Activision to work on Skylanders and along that way kind of figured out what I wanted to do and where I wanted to be in game development and also got to learn how to be you know a demoer and presenter of Skylanders and so one of my favorite memories was just kind of making my way into this wonderful weird streaming space and YouTube space and demo space uh, to help represent the amazing work that the team did and I still remember with the the first game you know we didn't want to talk about really the technology that went into it and just you know, wanted to watch magic. the magic and i still remember people getting really upset going yeah well how how's it how's it work i'm like oh it's magic clearly it's it's you put it on there and they come to life no 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 like what's what's in it like what how do you how do you do what, what's going on you know and <laughs> having almost getting into fights because There's it was magic so magical every skyline. yeah that they wanted to know how it really worked um so yeah, so that's who's going to be on the stream today. And so as mentioned, what we're going to do is we're going to play the game. We're going to take a look at some prototype footage. We're going to answer uh, some questions that you all out there have asked on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll have a good time doing it. So I figure I'll toss it back to Ray and Toby and we can kind of hop right in. All right. We're... Ah, there it is. Our little streaming thing. We wanted to start off at the we menu because we know we wanted to have Andy talk a little bit about our uh, logo screen, which was one of our fun stories. I think uh, Andy and Paul have something to say about this. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, Paul should join me for that. Not that screen. Not, not this one. See, we made this one. Uh, <laughs> make sure you wear your safety gear. When which we're not doing, doing but. So you don't hurt each other or your Skylanders. So what you're, what you're about to see is this Toys for Bob logo, we call it kind of a bumper video. And uh, one thing that's kind of special about this is that this was all built by hand. This is physically happening. I guess you could call it a stop motion bit. We actually, we had a little sliver of time at the very end when we were closing out the game to make this video. And what we actually did is worked with the character modelers and the character team to print out, I believe 64 individual 3D prints and reassembled yeah. them in real life and then composited together and then produced that because this we wanted to do this high concept of literally bringing a toy to life before the game even started. So that was a really fun little project that we worked on. Yeah, and we co-opted a uh, one of the meeting rooms for, I don't remember, it was about a week and built a very strangely set up little uh, light rig and studio to kind of uh, piece all the, the little bits together and, and take our first passes of prototypes. And um, it was actually interesting how close uh, the final was to what we, we were planning going in. Um, with the 3D printer uh, technology at the time, we were using standstone prints and they were very uh, fragile. 
but they did allow for colored prints, so it was really just as simple as using the same process we were using to print prototype toys and use those as the frames of animation. And it actually show game of those. Yeah, this is actually uh, using sandstone technique. Oh, there's a sandstone, yeah. Um, and so the, the sandstone, I, I think there was some, if, if you're interested, there's information about it on Twitter, but it does result in a colored uh, uh, toy in the end, fragile though they may be. Um, and yes, I forgot where I was going with that. But it was, uh, it was very interesting. And oh, I've, I've seen since that some stop motion uh, movies actually use similar 3D sandstone prints for face poses, uh, just like we did way back when. Thank you guys. Just go on, Flynn. Here we go. First level of the game. Flynn's already made his appearance. Good luck, Hugo. Boom. Boom. That actually leads to a great question uh, we got from I'm So Cool and Cool on Twitter. Which is why is Flynn so cool? Right, and my answer to that is Patrick Warburton and our entire our entire team of voice actors were brilliant and the game wouldn't have been the same without them yeah i mean to, to continue off of that I mean, we had so many characters with so many voices and so many personalities and patrick warburton as as flynn uh sumali montano as as cali uh we had the amazing richard horvitz as chaos and honestly, just about every voice actor that you can imagine covering all of these characters. Uh, and honestly, I think the, the personality uh, just was amplified by these wonderful voice actors. I love how eventually the, the, the plot of the Skylanders games became like Flynn was the main character in the story. Uh, and the Skylanders were like, let's do it. You know, I uh, always kind of thought it was a cool evolution of this character. It's kind of by necessity too, because I remember, yeah. you know, in terms of the cinematics, we really tried to get Skylanders be an active player in those, but we don't know who you're playing as, and we didn't have to create like hundreds of different variants of these cinematics just so that we could accommodate. Right. So, you know, right. these NPC, these non-playable characters are really the storytellers um, of this game. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, this is the only level that actually had something built into it that changed out which dialogue line was getting played if you were if you that the first skyline you put down was one of the three that came in the pack it would actually you know hugo would actually say the name all the other ones had to have, have some generic hey it's a skylander one yeah, of the that things was a consistent thing throughout the all the games is it was just very difficult to access uh, and account for which Skylander you were using as it became different sizes and different shapes. Uh, it, it became harder and harder to even, even have them moving around the frame because come at different lead rates and things like that. I mean, another thing that we do storytelling wise is that it's really fun to have the Skylanders be already known by this universe. I mean, like, these are already the heroes of who you are, and the Portal Master is a character as well um and just everyone's really excited to see you and it's this great sense of i'm a powerful thing that is able to run around it's a lot of fun right in most games you have to build yourself up from nothing into a hero in skylanders you start playing and all the npcs are worshiping the ground you walk on and it's one of the uh, it felt good in the first level you feel like a hero we all joined here this so I saw a uh, Wii remote symbol there oh, on yeah, the screen. Right. So it is uh, obvious we're playing this on the Wii. One of the questions that we got from Winner Nombre on Twitter was, why does Skylander Spires Adventure use a different engine on the Xbox 360, PS3, PC, Mac compared to the Wii version of the game? It's a great question. So the choice for Bob was, we thought we were making a, a Wii exclusive. And so we were well down the road, we had a schedule, and we were already having a hard time keeping up with uh, the pace of that schedule. And then uh, actors decided, hey, we want this to be big, we want it to be on all consoles. And so we partnered up with XPEC Entertainment, 
out of Taiwan, and they did all the brilliant work on the other consoles. And as the story would have it, they effectively reverse engineered all of the scripts and all of the code for the game. And um, I think that explains some of the differences between the products, but they did a wonderful job and we couldn't have done it for all the consoles without them. Yeah, I mean, they did a really nice job on an impossible task. I mean, they, there was, most of the stuff was identical, particularly the Skylander related stuff and the powers and the movements, traversal stuff all worked well. Uh, but, you know, some of the one-off stuff that we did, like the ship sequence in Pirate Seas and the robot sequence, which I happen to be responsible for both of those, not that I noticed these things, but uh, they were just a little off um, just because they ran out of time, understandably. I think it's also worth awesome. noting that, you know, they were doing this concurrently with us developing it. Right. It wasn't like we were done and we handed it over. So, like, they really pulled off some massive heroics, you know, just to get that thing going. And they Sorry, were, Mike, I cut you off. Oh, no problem. Uh, they, were, they were doing this by, they would play the game and see what had changed. And then they would make those changes into the game. Like, it wasn't like they, you know, were, were using code and stuff they just had assets really and saw right. how it worked and so you know we would have uh producers go over there you know and and help them sit down and play the game oh these things have changed you know uh that maybe you haven't noticed because like it really was just like uh, uh just let's play the new build and see what's in there now this is a particularly pretty level I really like the tornado there. Daniel, uh, Ada, you got any comments on you know, the art process of making these levels? Um, I know when we were proposing the levels, we wanted to be more toy-like. We even explored like some tilt-shift uh, looks of the game. But the big thing was the Wii lent itself really well to you know, vertex sliding okay. and to like, the self-colors. And remember, this was all like CRT, so later. we did a lot of uh, baking on the actual vertices so we can give it a painterly look. Um, so the big thing was like we used a lot of tiling textures so we can get this nice beautiful uh, pattern with kind of the smaller tornado, except these too. monster gates are in my it's a way. Fun project Monsters always stake out their territory by putting up these gates. That's Speaking of levels, you know obviously this is a level in the main game, but one of the questions that we got out there from MZ underscore primetime. Were there any levels scrapped in any of the games? Oh, <laughs> so many beautiful levels. One or two. <laughs> <laughs> More than that. But. So the, the scope of the original game as we put it was that we wanted to have a lot of small bite-sized levels. This was going to be for the Wii. We wanted to sort of focus on one mechanic for each one of them. And I think our original spec had something close to 80 levels. And just, you know, quick five-minute things. Like we had one that was like a gold rush, that everything was built around the mining mechanic that you got in some levels. Um, so there's a, like a C, an entire level full of these blocks that you could basically have to clear out and pick out stuff. And Anyway, but lots of levels and quick, uh, short attention span theater versions. Um, but then over time, uh, as we changed out our scope of whatever we're doing and we expanded to being on all the consoles we focused on okay let's get a, a core group of levels that's really blow them out to triple a quality and um you know that's that's that was a nice directive that we got we got an extra time we were originally going to come out in 2010. that was that was a crazy story for sure like it was maybe february of 2010, we were aiming to be final by end of summer, say. Yeah. The game was okay, but not great. Right. And we have Activision to thank for granting us another 10 months to work on the game. And the, the technology and the toys actually ended up being much better. There would not have been toys with brains if we had shipped in 2010. Because we shipped in 2011, the toys magically remember their names, all of your progress, what hat you're wearing. Um, it was actually the magic that developed in the, <laughs> the technology. 
That's right. It's always a good save. save. Wasn't it originally going to be like uh, you would wave the Wiimote over the the, the Skylander and that would be like how the Wiimote, Wiimote was going to hold the progress. progress. Yeah, that's. I think uh, I think the memory in the Skylander was much more magical for sure, but uh, it's kind of a no cool question. bit of history. There was some cut content for boss battles too. Um, when we were finishing the game, I was working on the boss battles that had like chaos summoning the the Doomlanders or the, the evil Skylanders, I suppose they were at the time, and. Um, I tried to make it so that you could fight not just one of each of the evil Skylanders, but three of the same type all at once. And I had that working, um, but it was kind of near the end of the project, so we're like, well, we'll, we'll save that sort of thing for uh, another game. Um, and it wouldn't be until Skylanders Trap Team, uh, where we had like boss battles that kind of like scaled with the difficulty levels and had different behaviors and um, more difficult attacks. Um, but uh, certainly, certainly the, the the desire was there. Ray, who just ran past you? Your favorite uh, characters? The Royal Mabu family for their only appearance in Skylanders. I'm actually curious what happened to them. They've been hiding ever since. <laughs> uh, you mentioned like there originally there were going to be a lot of really small levels, uh, and for the ones that were made, I think we ended up using a lot of them as uh, challenge right. levels, right? Oh, oh, that's, that's what, what happened, happened right? right. Yeah. I think so. I mean, there were probably still a lot that we had that we had prototyped and not used, but uh, I, I think we used most of it. Right. That's an excellent point. I forgot about that. Thank you, Mike. We also just recently met a Chompy for the first time on the playthrough. That is one of my my favorite enemies. Um, I believe yours and everyone, everyone, right? I suppose so, yeah. Was that an Errol Otis creation? Am I remembering this correctly? Uh, it seems like something he would make. And, um, yeah, those guys are, are near and dear to my heart, as you can tell from my background with Chompy Mage. Yeah. Yeah, for those of you who have a developed video game, and by the end of it, you feel like, it feels like a family. Your development team, you go through so many tough times and challenges together that you feel like a family. And so even the people that aren't at Toys and Bob anymore, we keep in touch with them. And um, they are close to our hearts, and they always will be. Um, it was a special time, Toys and Bob. Yeah, it's nostalgic for us, like, thinking back about this, because, like, there's just so many old friends who, um, you know, we don't see as much, but just as like, you know, you as players can remember playing this with like your family. Um, we remember developing this with each other and it was a really magical time for us. Like I would so just enjoy, um, you know, you hear about crunch in the video game industry. That's not how I felt that at all. It was just like joyful to be able to work on this. Um, for the boss battles, I would be working like, you know, midnight and beyond just because it was so much fun. Um, we had like this wonderful scripting language made by Fred Ford and Paul Ritchie um, where you could just like, you're playing a boss battle and you want to change something. So then you just like type something on the uh, computer, you click it with the mouse, and then it immediately updates in the game. And it was just such a good um, loop for developing. It was, it was like as fun as playing games, I think. Uh, yeah, and that's a good way to think about that too. I mean, Fred Ford used to say that his favorite thing about on Alpha Day, he had nothing to do because the tool set was sort of self-contained gave the designers the sort of freedom to do whatever they want, which has a lot of responsibility, by the way, because then the designers, if they've scripted themselves into a corner, that's their fault to figure it out. But he still had to bail us out sometimes. <laughs> I was going to say, the tool set gave you enough rope, was, I think, the tool. Correct. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Our lead scripter, Dan Gerstein, was so good at helping everyone like out of the trouble that we created for ourselves. Indeed. Uh, and, and we did. We created trouble. I'm uh, switching save game those. here so that we can oh, have yeah. uh, some of our levels unlocked. Sure. And we were, were going to jump in. Oh, well, we were going to head over to Stormy Stronghold. That's got a storied history in Toys for Bob history. Uh, this was the level that we started as our vertical slice. For those who have uh, been paying attention to video game stuff, uh, a vertical slice is sort of a representation 
of what our finished product is going to look like, and we do it at a point where it's even pretty alpha. Uh, we're just getting every component of it working and smooth and so forth. Um, and this was the level we decided to do it on. Of course, let me start yeah. actually selecting said level. It's hard to talk and play at the same time. Yeah, you guys, you guys get the level going. Uh, to come <laughs> off of what Ray was saying, uh, yeah, vertical slice. Think of a, a slicing a, a piece of cake, right? It's got all the elements there. It's got the the cake. It's got the the, the layers of, of frosting if you're doing it right. Uh, and so, you know, for a game development studio, what that means is taking a small subsection of a game with a whole bunch of the elements that you want to present in the game, and, you know, as part of the larger experience, to something representing a finished state. So. When you hear alpha, alpha is usually the whole game. A vertical slice is just like a level. But now, we're in Stormy Stronghold. And uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to bring Mike Stout in, so that way he can talk us toward a bit of the uh, enemy design set up here and what this level kind of represents. Yeah. Uh, so I remember uh, working on this. Uh, Toys for Bob provided me with a top-down map of the level, and then I sort of wrote over it with like what I was suggesting for how we could do it. Uh, you know, like um, what kind of enemies we could do, how we could set them up uh, so that the players encountered them and they asked really specific questions of them. And then also that we put a ton of breakables everywhere because uh, people like breaking things and getting, you know, uh, shiny bubbles that pop out of it. Uh, so the, the main thing that we learned while doing this level was probably one of the most important things in terms of uh, both the level design and the hero design was like, what do you do that makes you want to switch to another Skylander? Uh, because if you never want to switch to another Skylander, then, that's bad. You know, you, yeah, that's, that's not great because the whole game is about switching heroes. Uh, so what we came up with was, what if we just think of a few categories of things that the Skylanders could do. And then the level design could ask questions regarding those things. And so if you have a Skylander that specifies and say two of those things, they might not be optimal in a situation that's that would be optimal for another one. Uh, so to give you an idea of some of the stuff uh, in our, uh, you can you can definitely see this in the, the characters we put in the starter pack. Uh, one would usually have, like, specialize in uh, an attack that goes straight at something. One would usually have some sort of indirect attack, like a lob. And then one would usually have a close range, like, hit everything around you sort of attack. And so we could design stuff in the levels that would make one, of the, one or more of those things more important. Uh, so, like, you could have a... You'd have a gap in the level, right? And a Skylander would have to run across, around the gap, because in, in SSA you couldn't jump yet. Uh, and so we could put enemies on the other side of the gap, and like, if you could shoot straight across, well great, you don't, you know, if you're the close-up Skylander, you gotta run around and get it. But if you can shoot straight across or lob, that's great. But if there was cover there, and they were standing behind cover and lobbing things at you, the straight attack wouldn't work anymore. Right? You'd have to use the lob attack or run around and get it. Uh, you put something up on a ledge, right? That confounds the straight-ahead attack. The lob attack is better. Uh, so it was a combination of these little tools that we had in the level design and the, uh, the things that the enemies could do to prompt you to want to use one or more of the different Skylanders. Um, you can actually see in some of the enemies in this level how it worked. Like, we wanted to have a... A little one-shot enemy, which I... Are, are they the chumpies in this level? Uh, they are definitely the chumpies. The chumpies are always, yeah. yeah. And then we would have two medium enemies. Uh, one with a ranged attack, and one with a, a close range attack. And then usually some sort of a big enemy that, when it showed up, ideally that would be your priority. What you'd want right. to take out. Um, but, because of the things that we could do with the level design that would change what the what the correct answer to the question is, uh, sometimes maybe you'd want to go hit that big character. But if, if the level was arranged so that character was up on a ledge or across a gap, well, maybe you want to fight the easy enemies that are, are closer to you. 
So it became like a series of little decisions that the player was making as they were going through. And uh, based on the situation, what toys did you have? What, what, had, you, what had died already in the level? Uh, what were you fighting? All of these things kind of created this massive Venn diagram of little decisions that you have to make. And that sort of uh, is how we found the answer to that question of why do you want to switch to another Skyland. And we had other things that we did, you know, like the elemental zones or the, uh, the Skylanders being more powerful. And those overlaid on everything else helped a lot uh, with, with that, that idea of which Skylander do I want to use. But the core foundation of it was the stuff that we figured out in this level. Cool. And I guess that's a, that's a great segue on uh, just talking about switching up the Skylanders, because it leads us to the question from the Skylander dude on Twitter, which I will ask our entire panel of, of guests here. Which playable or non-playable character did you have the most fun working on? Or, if you didn't work on characters, playing with. So I figure, uh, since they're, they're playing right now, Ray, Toby, favorites? Ah. Uh. I have, I have to say Prison Break, and that's not just because I happen to have from Giants, which I probably shouldn't be playing here, but my special Life Core Employee Edition version. Oh boy, I know. Uh, but yeah, his his ability to just make mischief with dropping rocks that then reflect all the crystals. Some people do. They can be wrong. <laughs> But yeah, his, his ability to deliver a hot laser death, as Jeff Griffin would say. Yeah. yeah For me, it was yeah. Ghost, oh. Ghost Roaster. For the mere reason that he had a really interesting dynamic where to, to use his kind of go ethereal power, he actually had to sacrifice some HP. He lost health, which is uh, just not something people like to do. Um, and um, it's cool that that made it the ship version of the game. On a, along similar lines, uh, Trigger Happy, who used to be known as the Golden Cheat, he, he, he actually shot his own money, so he would lose gold as he was attacking enemies, which was a really interesting dynamic. He could also steal gold from enemies, but we ended up not shipping with that because people love their gold too much, and we thought that would be a popular choice. There was also a lot of people who weren't realizing that as they were shooting, the treasure was going down. <laughs> Mike, what's your favorite? Wrecking Ball. Because uh, he's the most adorable Skylander uh, until Chopper, way later in the series. Uh, but no, I mean, in a, in a series full of monsters that all had spikes and sharp edges, we had this one little, round, gigantic-eyed, long-tongued, adorable... Uh, whatever the hell it is, right? Uh, <laughs> and I grill. loved it, and I loved that it, it was a pinball and it shoot all around. Uh, anyway, yeah, wrecking ball. Very cool. Paul Ian, favorite? Yeah, I think I have to agree on this. I have a soft spot in my heart for little chibi-like characters, and usually, like, the proportions are either they're one or two heads tall. So, like, trigger happy, definitely chopper. Chopper was the dinosaur one, right? And the, the, yeah, that yeah. one was a great one. And like Pop Fizz, those characters were just so bouncy and squishy and so small and cute, but uh, devastating at the same time. Gotta go back Daniel. to your stuff. Uh, I'd have to also say Wrecking Ball. Uh, yeah, I just loved seeing. I worked on the level, so I didn't really know. And when I was testing them, we'd have blue chips to test out the characters, and I would drop it in there. So this weird blue ball rolling around, and uh, immediately fell in love with it. Yeah, just so much character. If I, if I had to get past the level, though, I would have to use Drobot just because he shot out <laughs> lasers and he was he's he was for work, but uh, you know, I could just enjoy a level. Chris Nelson. Well, I was going to say Drobot too. Um, <laughs> the reason for that though is because that was the uh, one of the characters I designed an ability for. It was the hover strafe, uh, where you could just strafe side by side and move slowly and aim accurately um but in terms of the entire cast i was really happy when this guy the chompy mage uh became playable um i worked on the chompy mage boss battle um and uh, there was a lot of 
bullet hell inspiration for that, obviously, um, and Drobot as well. So you know, you'll see that in a lot of my work. I think Skyland is such a fun um, thing for us to work on because we can put our passions into it. There's like so many ways each of us can bring uh, what we like from video games and put it into in the Skylanders. Andy. Uh, it's tough because I animated quite a few of them. Um, it's like choosing between the kids. But uh, if I had to pick, I mean, Trigger Happy is really high on the list. Working on him was a blast. Uh, and he did come a long way during development. And I remember when I first started animating him, uh, you know, you get this character that's basically a, a raindrop with arms and legs sticking out of his head. And it's like, how are you supposed to do anything without, you know, a spine or a waist or knees i mean he's just a little little guy um but it actually just was very freeing so you were able to just animate basic shape movement around the screen and have as much fun with it as you wanted uh and i i just thought that was really a, a blast to animate uh and then chop chop would be the other one um that i had a soft spot for because working with the designer on that we had a really good uh it was nat low i think was the designer on that one and we had a really good back and forth on Chop Chop, and we had a lot of ideas for what he was supposed to be. And I, I do remember his his animation folder was was a just a wasteland of ideas that got we tried and didn't work. I mean, at one point he had a nine way attack combo, and you could switch back and forth between the the A and the B button, which would go sword shield shields. They're like, however, you finished your combo would be you know, the, the finisher would be based on the other two attacks that were in the three-part combo. Uh, it was just like, it was way too complicated, but it was also really cool. Um, and we could just do just amazing things with them. Uh, and that was that goes for all the Skylanders. They just all kind of evolved as you played along uh, and, you, and you worked on them and got to all such interesting places. Very cool. Yeah, and as for me, I've got a giant Zoom background <laughs> <laughs> my favorite here. I've got Double Trouble peeking in over my shoulder. Um, you know, I, I love the character, how he plays. I love the personality. Uh, you know, it always felt really great to feel smart, kind of kiting the enemies and leaving little Double Troubles behind you that would take them out for you. Um, but also, I just also love the, the tiki kind of style of the character, especially when I'd always come and visit the Toys for Rob studio, because all of our, you know, uh, cubicle areas and everything have kind of thatched, you know, bamboo appearances. Uh, you can kind of see it behind Toby and Ray, and so it always just felt like a perfect fit uh, for the game in the studio. And so Double think, Trouble didn't always look that, like that. That is true! Yeah. Who wants to tell the story of what Double Trouble used to look like? I don't know if there's a story, but I remember oh. his his name, we used to call him Mesmorph Wizard. You know, all of these characters, we would have like 50 different names. It would be super confusing because in the tool, we would save it as one thing, and then later on, it functionally changes to something else, and we would call it something else. Uh, Somebody would yeah, spell it wrong. For the longest time, he was like more of a conventional, traditional wizard, and he had like the big, long beard. Um, there were certain personalities at, at, at Activision that was, uh, yeah, was not really a big fan of the... Uh, things that came out of the nerd dungeon i guess yeah. quote. <laughs> well, i think it was also like kids don't want to play as old people yeah. uh, <laughs> case in point bomb troll who oh. eventually became boomer mm -hmm. uh yeah he uh uh most popular, popular i think it was his his gray his gray beard oh yeah he never came back did he uh here's here's my uh original boomer oh skills. yeah that's true still with oh, beard pants he still dyed his hair pants. <laughs> Yeah, more youthful, old beardy pants. I do remember talk about whether or not green Skylanders were the problem. Like if it was <laughs> if just green Skylanders weren't selling. Right. And was that what but it was, Paul? Was it green Skylanders? That was one of the, the thoughts. There yeah. were many yeah. theories because, because of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? A lot Bill of analysis. Did great. Yeah. So, that's true. The exception, not the rule. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, because they were worried about uh, female Skylanders selling too, and then Stealth Elf did great. So who knows? Analysis is analysis. All right, so we have finished that level, and I think you guys were going to hop over to another level. Or I think you we want to watch the, yeah, but... the special oh, level before seeing content. Oh, that's right. The, the world, world premiere so... of the prototype of Spyro's Kingdom. That's right. That is a good, good next beat. So does anyone want to explain what we're going to look at? 
Sure. So when you when you make a video game, you have to prove to your publisher that uh, it's a good idea and that it's going to work and that you have the, that you're technically able to create it. And so you produce a prototype of the game, which is usually in a level or in a game like this, um, a level. And so we made a level that this is before portals even really existed, before our RFID, our character cast was very small, and uh, we wanted to get some ideas on screen to prove both to Activision and to ourselves that it was a good idea. And we have we have happened to have captured it, a video of it, and we're going to show it to you right now. <laughs> we called Skylanders Minions back then. It was a long uh, set of discussions about what they would be called. Was the word champions? Minions. Yeah, I was talking to Lou about this this week. I, I think that we were calling the place Skylands. And someone at Activision, just kind of in an offhand manner, referred to the, the characters as Skylanders. And boy, what a great name for a series. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it may have been Donna Lou. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, I remember yeah. her, you know, she, she, whenever we'd have all these meetings to name the characters, she's like, yeah, I already named the game, I'm good. And then she was just... <laughs> So, you can't top that. here's the beloved Cyclops Nail. Oh, we have to switch away from him because he can't open the Rocky Cave opening. But Cyclops Nail was an early favorite in the studio. And I think many of the questions on Twitter were, what happened to Tarclops? Well, Cyclops Nail became Tarclops because Cyclops Nail was thought to be too close to some characters from other properties that we won't mention. Um, and so then he became Tarklops, and I think was going to be in the starter kit. But at some point, maybe Lou or someone can remember, it was determined that he was not starter kit material. And uh, that's when Trigger Happy joined the fun. I think the, the concern about the character looking too similar to other properties still lingered even in the change to yeah. Tarklops. Because we were, at one point he was purple, and then he was red, and then he was black, and then he was, I guess Legal was saying something like, the problem is he's got one eye. And we're like, okay, well, I guess we're going to just redesign this character at this point. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, he became uh, Zan. Right. One of the... One of the things you can see in, in the old prototype is kind of how it was originally conceived that we would try to get you to switch Skylanders, like you did. Put a, a rock wall in your way, and if you had an Earth Skylander, you could go knock it down, like, like Rock Dragon here. Uh, and uh, uh, like people, people in user testing sort of found it like, oh, I don't really want to, I'm not, I'm, it's messed up my flow, I don't really want to switch to another Skylander right now. It was, it was less organic. Uh, at least I kind of remember that being the case. Yep. That notion yeah. of like hard gating still persisted with the elemental gates, but he was off the main path, so we yeah. were able to kind of get the best of both worlds there. Right, particularly what happens if you burn through all of your rocks, or, you know, the ones that can take out the barrier that you've got in front of you. It was tricky for level design, though. You had to make challenges that really any Skylander could surmount, because you never know, someone may have lost their their Earth character or, or any other Skylander. So you couldn't specifically design a puzzle to only be solvable by one Skylander or Skylander type. Nothing on the main path, anyway. Yeah, we did have some... Uh, traversal mechanics, like you're seeing here that uh, Cyclops still is able to cover water when other characters could not. Um, that was sort of the extent of what we had talked about. Uh, 
think we had our dragons also live by, too. Yeah, the dragons would fly. Or, or water. Yeah, I guess this, this portal version, like this interface here was, you know, you were actually just thumbing through on your Wiimote, you weren't <laughs> actually interfacing with toys, which, I mean, that whole process of designing that flow was, I, I had a great deal of fun doing that with Dan Gerstein, just to make it as optimal as possible of making it feel the, the tangible quality of lifting a toy off and making sure that visually that was reflected in the timing, because we didn't have access to all the information on the toy immediately, like we were streaming in, the name, the element type, we didn't have the character model until like two seconds in and stuff like that. So we had to like develop that sequence to be super tight to picking up the toy and dropping one on again. It's, it's just, just like a, a week's week worth of work, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A week, yeah. I mean, that led to the, the development of the magic moment, right? Which is one of the iconic experiences of playing Skylanders game. Yeah, that was, uh, that was such a... There were so many opinions about that moment because we, we defined this the uniqueness of this it's just really interfacing with the physical world and um, the fantasy of these characters are being plucked out of the universe and then plopping down back in so making sure that all felt tight with the visuals the animation the sound even the sound of like warping down and time scaling the sounds that you're in a timeless space was a really uh, all these little touches added up into something that feels natural and um, what you would expect, but there were so many micro decisions and agonizing points that we all debated and iterated on for weeks and weeks and months. It was amazing how... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. That portal power was actually existed in real life, so they were definitely the level. The portal power over Oddity look was the actual prototype that they were using, so I felt like it sold. It was kind of like the barrier between the toy world and the actual game world. Thing to see happen. Yeah, yeah I thought it was really thing? interesting. Oh. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, I was just gonna uh, dovetail from the uh, how the hardware informed sort of the decisions with the magic moment that informed sort of narratively how we developed uh, the relationship between all the, the various bits of the game. I mean, you had the world of Skylands, you had the NPCs there, you had Skylanders, you had Portal Masters, and how all those were things were related. Um, you know, Eon could talk to the portal master, but generally the, the Skylanders and the characters in Skylands themselves very rarely referred to portal masters. Um, and they could never just look at the screen and talk to the portal master. But all these like decisions kind of uh, just were born sort of naturally out of how the relationship between the hardware and the game and the characters in the world uh, synthesized. So I just thought that was a really cool uh, way that the story kind of developed. I had a lot of ambitions with the portal too. And I remember we had talked about putting a screen on there and you would see, we would use it as a HUD or it would speak to you and tell you when you're in danger. And I think it ended up boiling down to the color on the portal was indicator of your health. But, you know, we found that players were not referring visually, looking down at the portal during gameplay, so it wasn't as useful that way. But some of those ideas kind of trickled on later on to work like Trap Team. We actually did put a speaker in there and it became useful for that particular capture moment. But those were things that were all being discussed like, in really early days. Glad to see the Chompies have always been here. From the very beginning. You know, one other thing is how the toys really sold this to Activision. And what we knew is the fact that we kept making, as Mike showed off earlier, his version of the early prototypes of the bomb troll uh, became like a collector's item for these uh, green light meetings. You, you'd go in to show off the, the state of the game to the uh, executives and they would all get excited, they'd pick up the toys, they'd look at them, all of these hand-painted ones that we had, and then by the, you know, the end of the meeting, people were talking, drifting around, and all of a sudden, I remember we would hear stories that the people that were doing the demo would turn and half of the skyline was gone because these people would grab them and were like really cool and would take them home to their kids and we'd hear later on it's like the kids went nuts over them. So that's how we knew we were on the something when the uh, actually, prototypes kept going away. 
that's actually a really good real quick segue into the notion of how we got you know initial uh prototypes right because initially you know, this was before 3d printing really and so all of the original ones were hand sculpted you know out of clay hand painted and then to like duplicate them had to work with other teams to then duplicate out of hand sculpting the ones that were made by the studio and then you know all of these crazy you know ultra you know rare handmade uh things were the initial skylanders and then obviously 3d printing came into be and the studio was quickly populated with refrigerator sized 3d printing units uh <laughs> Stop talking oh, about the, this is too good. Yeah, so, so by, by the way, way what, what you're seeing right now is something that we uh, threw in late at night. It's an Easter egg for the people that got to play the prototype. They managed to click through the 80 prompts we put in. Uh, Chubby <laughs> Madness. We were, we were just talking about like um, how the hardware the, the magic moment kind of affected how we thought about everything. One of one of the ones that always struck me was we need to let them play with their toys the way they want to play with their toys. Yeah. Because the way you play with toys is different than the way you play a game. Uh, and we so we always wanted to honor the fact that you have these toys. Let's let you do. Let's let you play with them how you want. That's a lot of chompies. The Wii is about to catch up. Paul referring to that as the <laughs> Chompy Artichoke. <laughs> Chompy <laughs> Chompy. So, uh, yeah, we actually have some of the initial. Uh, let me see if I can get it on the camera here. But it's like this is one of the molds that we did to make the Skylops. Skylops. Cyclops snail. That. Uh, you know, just standard resin built all, built out of a mold, and off. Out he comes. One of the kind. <laughs> and then that's you know the hand painted version. And I think that one was sculpted by Eway, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember mm -hmm. Eway and uh, Irene painting those too. Yeah. I mean, that was honestly one of the things that was so incredible about working on Skyland is that it was, oh goodness, Ray, watch I, out, <laughs> um, is that it was literally like making two different products at the same time, right? And so you had a whole team of video game developers making, you know, video games. And then it's not like toys are an afterthought. I mean, toys are a monumental, you know, development process from just what they look like to what pose they're in to... You know, the actual just manufacturing of that many physical <laughs> A wonderful team called Red Octane as partners with the, the studio who had their, you know, experience making the, the plastic guitars for Guitar Hero. And, you know, pairing up with them really helped, you know, the, the team kind of figure out how to, you know, create a whole secondary development of making toys. And it was I always really cool to see those in progress. I know, I have to say that, uh, at least in level design, when this thing, when we were first talking about it, I kept expecting someone to finally run the numbers and say, you want us to make how many millions of toys? And just, you know, shut down the whole thing. Um, but to their credit, they sort of, they kept looking at it and seeing how people will respond to, you know, this, you know, the cycle of just taking the, cool toy and looking at it and putting it down and seeing it come to life in the game was wild. All right, I remember at right one point we were talking about the number of toys being built as like the, the the number itself was so big that it was hard to fathom. So the way that we would describe it was if you stack them one next to another, they would reach Mars, you know? <laughs> like, dude, we never got to Mars, I <laughs> I think we got to the moon, started out going around the world, uh, and then yes, I think we made it to the moon. Remember, we initially did a lot of the user testing uh, for Skylanders with the tokens, like the, the little RFID tokens, and when we switched to using the toys, taking that toy, putting it on the portal, having it remember the things that you did, uh, 
it was like night night and day people loved like liked the game with the toy with the chips and they loved the game with the toys uh so it was just a very interesting uh, uh like almost overnight right we had toys and then the user tests were different it was cool yeah i remember that um Eric Hirschberg described it as usually you have, when you're doing any kind of user testing, you have three populations. You have people who really like it, people who are neutral, people who dislike it. And he described it as it was something like the marketing team had never seen before where there was literally only one population where they loved it and they couldn't get enough of it. Um, he described that as, as just like such an anomaly and that's how they knew early on that they were onto something cool. Are we hopping into another level, gentlemen? We're having a bit of trouble on this end right now. I think we may... It may take us a few minutes. So, uh, any other questions that you've got? Blue and your giant hopper? I've got a big old thing of questions. Um, I mean, I guess we can go around the room. Uh, you know, what was your favorite experience from the entirety of the Skylanders journey, character creation, toy designing, world building, anything across all of the games. Wow. What was what was your favorite? If you had to put the Skylanders memory for you, Ray West. Oh. On you first. <laughs> what would it be? It's very hard because the thing that I got the most satisfaction about was something we didn't even put into the franchise. Um, we had talked at one point about, you know, what's a new gimmick, what's something else that we can do, and we came up with a way that we could actually build our own levels. And I mean, that says something about the way that we can prototype things is like over the course of a weekend, was able to take a whole lot of created art from giants, come up with a system, and was able to come up with something that basically uh, real time could drop a piece of art in, and then you would drop another piece of art in. And, then, and so you basically lay out an entire level, and it was built in a way so that it could be compressed and actually fit onto the, the, the magic contained within a toy. Um, you take it over to your friend's house and have it. But it was something that we wound up not going with because if we wanted to do something, we would want it to have it be the central component of a game. And there were so many other good ideas, like with Trap Team and Imaginators. You know, we decided, you know, well, let's put this off and we'll revisit it at some point. So, I mean, it's still out there. Just saying. But that was my favorite moment, was showing it off to the company, something that we had basically been, a skunk work project that we had been putting together. Uh, over the course of about maybe three days of work, we had something that was really incredibly compelling. And that just says everything about how the creative forces here can drive things and make things happen uh, and be able to get you know, all of these great minds. Toby, do you have a favorite moment? Uh, yeah, I slate one moment. Um, I, I think the most satisfying aspect of developing the game for me was seeing all of the combat systems and game systems come together. And they were, for better and worse, they were using the scripting language that you guys were talking about earlier. And working with the team and struggling through that process, throwing out bad ideas, keeping the good. Um, and then eventually actually shipping SSA in 2011 and seeing the fan response. Um, hard to top that. Yeah. Daniel, any favorite moments? Yeah, just the permission to just have all the different level variety in the game. I mean, I can't think of other games that artists were allowed to go crazy in a way and um you know when we get it from designers they already did the camera work and stuff and it just kind of felt like you were helping build an amusement park and um that was just always fun just excited to get the gray mesh excited to show 
the designers what we did and then it, there was always an and then moment and just uh, working uh, with everyone so many talented artists and so many great level designers Paul? Uh, wow, yeah I think designing the magic moment that was definitely very special for me working with Dan on that one but I think maybe this is not a moment but just like an ongoing kind of process thing I remember that um, when Eway and um, later on some of the other concept artists, when they started to just flesh out some ideas, the animation team would be just like <laughs> looming over their shoulders, just like, oh, which one can I get at, you know, and call divs, like, oh, that idea would be fantastic. And so we would have like really this, uh, it felt like Christmas when we got to see those concept art because we could start to have this discussion with the character designers about like what we could do. And then there's, and then there's a follow-up moment, even when we actually make the 3D print of it, we finally had it modeled up in, in the computer and we'd look at it and awe at it. But the moment that we could hold it, for some reason, just being able to touch that character just inspired a different level of thinking beyond all the conceptual stuff and, and the conversations that we're talking about in abstract. So that was very special and something that just an experience you wouldn't have in any other video game. Nelson? So each of us on the stream has like favorite games from our childhood and not just favorite games, but games that are special to us. And if you're watching the stream out there on Twitch, um, Skylanders might be something like that for you. And in, like being able to work on a game that is special to people, like that's that's why we're here. That's why we, that's why we try so hard um, to just try to pay that back and um, put something special into the world. So once we were seeing that people were having that reaction and, and loving the series so much, that just like warmed all of our hearts so much. Um, and then I guess a side that we hadn't talked about was like just going into toy stores like Toys R Us and seeing the giant displays after every release. Like, wow, that was, that was just something unfathomable. Mike. Yeah, I, I'm similar to Chris. Uh, the For me, uh, Skylanders was the first game I worked on where like YouTube was a thing. Um, like YouTube had been around for a while, but it isn't what it is. It wasn't what it is now. It wasn't TV, right? It was it was a place where people put videos, you know? And, uh, and it was just starting to get to the point where it's gonna be what it is like now. But I could, I could all of a sudden see people playing through my game and interacting with content that I'd made and talking about it, right? Like it was it was like user testing only way better because they were constantly saying what they were thinking. Uh, and it just made me a, a lot better at my job, but also was just, you know, uh, so rewarding to see how, how much it meant to people. Uh, you're going to toy stores, like Chris said, and, and seeing the Skylander section and overhearing, you know, people talking about like what they wanted to get and, uh, you know, seeing, seeing kids excited about it. Like it was, it was just so, or, or I could talk to people who had kids and they knew about what I'd worked on, you know? Uh, I hadn't, I had never worked on anything. Where, like uh, if, if you talk to people in the industry, they all know who Ratchet and Clank is, but like, you know, the, the person who uh, cuts my hair didn't, but <laughs> That person had kids, so they knew about Skylanders. Uh, so yeah, it was just a very, very interesting experience. Cool. Yeah, I know for me, you know, uh, I think Chris said it really well, and you know, I, I got to do a lot of really cool tours and show off the game to so many people, and I got to figure out how to combat stage fright and do presentations for the thing, you know, and I, I got to figure out what I kind of wanted to do with my whole kind of career, as I mentioned, but none of that compares to getting to harness dad joke energy and figure out what to name and, you know, help with the taglines on characters. And as, you know, all, all my friends on the stream know, the dad joke energy thrives <laughs> in my core of being. And so getting my first you know like tagline or my first you know character name i still remember you know because we what we would do for the the characters is just come up with just lists of names just these massive like every character probably has you know 50 to 100 alternate names 50 to 100 you know alternate taglines 
and if your name got you know like picked through the 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 mass selection process and all the executives it was just the highlight and i still i still remember my first two so my first tagline was for shroom boom of he shoots he spores and my first skylander was on giants was a uh, thump back and so you know i i nothing you know validating my love of dad jokes and bad punnery <laughs> into career progression I, I yeah you can you know you, you can't make a, a better experience than, than working on skylanders all right i think we've gotta start wrapping it up um we're gonna we wanted to get into one more level having a few technical difficulties sharing the screen for it so we're gonna have to close it down for the day See you guys in a year for uh, for Skylanders for Skylander Giants. Giants. Yeah, Skylanders Giants. Just just in case you guys were wondering. <laughs> yeah. Um, I I do you know real quick. I just want to say you know thanks to everyone who's who's tuned in. You know, uh, and really huge immense shout out to uh, Vern and Sydney uh, on you know IT and op side of things for getting us all together for this. This has been a great experience I know for us. Hopefully it has been for you. Thank you so much for sticking around Warts and All. We'll get better at this. Hopefully we can do it again. Uh, maybe in a year, maybe sooner. We'll see. Uh, any any parting words, everybody? Oh boy. Also shout I, uh, out to Mandy for the beautiful overlays. Oh, yeah. there's, there's a lot yes. of behind the scenes work here. We're probably not gonna be able to list all of them, but um, also special um, prod over to Ray. This was his idea. And so yeah. him pushing it all the way through, you know, this, this, this was really fun. And I, I hope people enjoy this. Uh, maybe we'll do more of them. Yeah. Sounds great. We love making Skylanders games for you and we, we miss doing that. So thank you for being on the journey with us. Thank, thank you, you Portal Masters. Masters. Such a joy. Yes. So yeah, so I'll go around real quick. Uh, any famous last words? Mike, sit out. Uh, Chaos still owes me $5. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Akeda. Thanks for loving the game as much as uh, we love making the game. Paul? Boom. <laughs> Couldn't have said it any better. Andy? <laughs> I just want to say thanks. We couldn't have done that without all, uh, all the fans and all the love you guys have for the game. We, we love it just as much as you guys do. Toby, any, any last parting thoughts? Sure. I, I've been thinking about the game a lot over the last couple of weeks, and in playing one of the levels, I just recovered the eternal life source. It, it, it joined back into the core of light, and Hugo turns to Arbo, son of Barbo, child of Larbo, and says, what a remarkable creation. And Arbo looks at the screen and says, we are all remarkable creations. That's very nice. Couldn't have said it any better than that. So I think uh, we'll wrap it up. But again, shout out to everyone at Twice for Bob, all of our development partners and friends, you know, folks who made the, the 3DS games, the, the other games by Curious Visions, Beanox, uh, you know, friends at Red Octane, friends at Activision. You couldn't have done it without... Uh, the production crew that you know I initially started with the marketing the, the toy team everybody there's so many people uh, to thank um, but again thank you all portal masters uh, for coming and uh, hope to see you soon bye everybody. Bye, everyone thank bye, you everyone. Bye, everyone. bye we love you bye y'all Thank you.